This is the Marketing Podcast Network. Stories influence, teach, and inspire us. But what about the storytellers who create them? Uncorking a Story profiles storytellers to uncover how their background and life experiences influence the stories they create. We learn what motivates them, their path to success, and what fuels them to keep creating. It all starts by asking one simple question, where does your story begin? Welcome to Uncorking a Story. Now here's your host, Mike Carlin. Well, hello and welcome to Uncorking a Story. I'm your host, Mike Carlin. And today I'm pleased to introduce you to Nick Johnson. Nick is the co-founder and managing director of one of Asia's premier networking organizations. He built a caring community that provides hundreds of executives a safe haven to share their challenges and receive support and learn from each other. He joins me today to talk about his personal story, as well as his book entitled Executive Loneliness, The Five Pathways to Overcoming Isolation, Stress, Anxiety, and Depression in the Modern Business World. Welcome to Uncorking Story, Nick. Thank you so much, Mike. It's great to be with you. Nick, I'm very happy to have you here. And I'm going to ask you the question I ask everybody, uh, which is, uh, tell me, where does your story begin? Well, Mike, I think it should start from 2018 when I personally hit rock bottom. I had uh, lost my career. I had uh, divorced my wife. My son had gone uh, with her to another country. I had lost my health from being a fit guy doing marathon and Ironman events. Uh, I instead had picked up some bad habits. I gained weight. I was eating the wrong food and I started to drink too much alcohol. So with that, you know, my life was going down and I was lying basically there in the sofa. I remember looking at my left foot, which was swollen. And I thought, this is this, is this it? I had uh, written my will and my testament and I just couldn't see the way out at that stage, Mike. That 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 was rock bottom for you. Well, we'll rewind a little bit prior to 2018. What was your career, and and um, you know what what were you doing? Um, I spent 15 years in general management. I was uh, leading uh, quite some big organizations. One of the biggest was with uh, uh, basically a general medical uh, general manager medical services, managing clinics, hospitals, doctors, and so on. So I was in the medical industry. And uh, other jobs I had was uh, in mainly in Vietnam, Indonesia, and Thailand. So in various expat roles in general management. Okay, so you were, I mean, you were you were pretty senior up there. And uh, is it true what they say? It's lonely at the top. Oh yes, certainly. And and looking back now at my career and why I crashed myself so badly was that I kept it all to myself. And especially when you work then like I did in medical industry, you have doctors by your side and so on. And you, you're always wondering what are they thinking about me and you're keeping things to your side. It's so competitive, especially also if you're an expat, you have these assignments, you're, you're always on a contract and you worry, should I, will I get this contract renewed? Will someone else get it? So you're constantly living almost with a, you know, a knife on your throat when it comes to your career. And, you, you tend to start elbow your way up to the top and then you isolate yourself. And with that, uh, you know, the health deteriorates. So you, I mean, you, you had, you had gotten to the, you know, approaching the top of your career, you have a family, um, your company is sending you overseas to, to work. Um, but then all of a sudden they, they say that, that they don't want you to work for them anymore. And that's probably putting it mildly. Um, just kind of what was happening around that time? I mean, you know, what, what what were the reasons why, you know, so much of this was happening at, at one time? It, it, it was a process over a few years, Mike. And if I go back a couple of years earlier, I was working in Vietnam in 2008. I did really well. I fought as a sales director for an international cosmetic company. I had thought I had it all going for me until then the career was all going well. One day I was called into the office of my boss and I was let go. And that was a big blow to my ego. You know, I really, really couldn't accept it. And with that, of course, you know, you go into self pity and you start to blame others, you're building up resentments and so on. And that's, that really didn't put me in a good place. I managed to get a new job after a while, but the pain was still with me. And I carried that and the insecurity that started to build up was with me in the, in the years to come only to co come collapsing then back in 2015, a bit later on when, you know, I, I, it was just too much for me. And at that stage, 
uh, I was just waiting again for the moment of them to terminating me because I had so much insecurity. I felt that I couldn't really do what I should. So it was actually me resigning instead, uh, rather than waiting for them to do it to me. Got it. So you kind of you kind of defeatist almost in your own mindset. You had you had already um, had the door closed on you. Um, so you proactively closed the door yourself. It sounds like. Um, yes. I can I can relate in in um, December. I think it was December eighth of twenty sixteen. I received a phone call. I was in the middle of managing four large projects um, for a big research and consulting firm. Um, I was a partner in the firm. Um, and I, I was sort of blindsided. I think it was very close to Pearl Harbor day. And I, I feel like I got, like there was a sneak attack on me because I got a call saying that my, as of, you know, the end of January, my services would no longer be needed. And it really took, um, it took me by surprise. Um, and I got to a point where I, I couldn't, I didn't even tell my wife until, um, after a few weeks, because I, I, I didn't have the courage to tell her. Um, I was embarrassed and um, I felt like I needed to come up with like a new plan before I would just say, Hey, look, I, I got some bad news today. Um, but a lot of it was, was embarrassment. Um, did you, I mean, how, how did you, how did you deal with it with, with your spouse? I'm curious. Well, in the, the various jobs then with the first time when I was laid off, I, I did tell her and that's when she also told me that she was uh, pregnant. She had kept that secret for me. Uh, so it was basically two big shocks in one go. And then knowing that I was going to become a father, you know, without the job, but that really it was painful for me. I, that's why I got so much anxiety around that. But uh, later on, I, I started to isolate myself. I didn't tell uh, my ex-wife. I didn't involve her in the decisions. I even didn't involve my boss, who I thought I had a good relationship with. I should have told her that I was, uh, you know, insecure, that I was thinking about resigning. Instead, it was all in my mind. I didn't tell anyone about this uh, until I had already written the, 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 the resignation letter, which sat in my outbox for quite some time before I sent it. And everyone was shocked when that happened. Uh, so my, the learning from all of this is, is you know, that I, I, I just didn't tell anyone what was happening. So, yeah, very similar, Mike. And as I was researching for my book, I found that this is very common among us men that we, we don't discuss these things uh, because, yeah, we worry what people are going to say, what they're going to uh, think about us, and we care about our image, I think. Yeah. All right. So um, so you resign. And then to, does a downward spiral begin then, I mean, could you could you point to times before resigning that it, it, it had started or? Uh... Um, I had moments already from 2008 after that first uh, loss of a job for the next six, seven years. I had insecurity and I had times when it was uh, uh, life was down and I was in a depressed state. But most of the time it was pretty good. But it was that underlying sort of, you know, insecurity that always was there. So it was really in 2015 uh, that, that it really got bad. And um, that was the when I hit, uh, started my down uh, downward spiral. And then it was slowly, you know, uh, getting worse. And it wasn't overnight. It was over three years between 2015 and 18, where instead of going for my after work run, I would go to the bar and meet up with some friends and, and drink beers. So it was just that slow switch. Mm -hmm. But as you uh, as perhaps I used to exercise five, six days a week, suddenly it was once a week. And before I knew it, you know, I thought, why bother with this? It's, uh, uh, it's better just to go and meet them for a drink instead. Sure. And then, you know, nothing, uh, I, I'm a morning exerciser, so nothing will, will have you staying in bed longer than a hangover, <laughs> you know, or just feeling, feeling kind of sluggish. Um, and of course there's the extra calories that come with that. And, you know, the weight comes on. I know you mentioned, you know, gaining some weight. Um, but alcohol was sort of playing, replacing the role that it sounds like you're your fitness, your physical fitness, your exercise routine was having. Yes, of course, it gives you also that sort of, you know, the feeling that uh, it relaxes you a little bit, you socialize, and, and it made you feel that somehow I deserve this. I worked all day, it's stressful, uh, I'm doing well in the job, despite the insecurities, I deserve this. It was all those 
feelings there. And then, of course, it was just a temporary relief. But the next day it was all back again and the worries, the insecurities. And, uh, and, and I think it goes for any addiction we pick up that it, it, it's just a temporary relief and then it's worse again. Yeah. Did you did you consider yourself to be an alcoholic? Did you consider yourself to have an alcohol dependency? So I remember re identifying it as an issue around you know 2014 2015 there, and uh, I remember writing in my di diary that I need to start control it, and I started then to take blocks of two three weeks when I needed to do it often. It was okay, but eventually. I stopped. Uh, uh, I stopped doing this. I couldn't manage it anymore. And but of course, during that time, I was in complete full denial. Looking back at it now, yes, I was definitely an alcohol an alcoholic back then. Yeah, um, alcohol is one of those um, substances that is so readily available. Um, you know, I, I don't. I don't know. You know what advertising is like. I think you mentioned being in Singapore, right? Um, I mean, you can't turn on the TV without seeing an advertisement for beer, right? Or or wine or some kind of spirit. And this time of year, you know, it's all about celebration and and parties. Um, so for people who are looking to control or, you know, temper their alcohol use, it's, it's very difficult for them. How did you go about um, uh, recovery? Yeah, so in 2018, when I had hit rock bottom, uh, alcohol was a big factor why I was there, why I lost my health and so on. I had certainly been over drinking then for a few months in a row. It was just too much. I had even at uh, one stage then become a morning drinker. I needed a drink in the morning to, to basically stabilize myself. So it was, uh, <clears throat> you know, living up to it and, and taking responsibility for my life again. And what happened? I met uh, a woman who became my new wife at that time and she thought I was jolly and we we're having a good time no one on the outside realized that I was having an issue internally people just knew that you know I'd been working so hard before I had taken my exercise so seriously they said it's good to see you enjoying yourself Nick and good to see you meeting a, a woman and you're having a great time together you know but uh, as I was lying there and, and thinking about to myself you know when I wrote my will and testament and, and, and at that moment I I decided to tell my new wife, we were only married for three months at the time. But that was the first time in my life, I decided to speak up to someone how I felt inside. And she was completely shocked. But what happened with that, Mike was that immediately, I was on my path back, it was just somehow that the fact that I spoke into another human being or even said the words loud about this, I finally had admitted that, that I had an issue. And with that came, you know, the recovery very quickly. Yeah. How did she, did, did it change your relationship with her at all? I mean, it sounds like you met her sort of in the, on the bar circuit. Did, did it impact or in what ways might it have impacted your relationship with her? Uh, yes, it changed for the better right away. And I think like any human being would do or, or a wife, uh, new married at that stage, she, she showed care and, uh, the, the first thing she did, and which I reluctantly had to follow, was to go and see a doctor, of course, to do the blood work. Uh, and I was really scared about that because I knew it wouldn't be pretty. But she was there, and she was the one very, you know, aggressively almost dragging me in, talking to the doctor, and just setting it straight, which is what was needed. And then after that, she also reached out to our common friends, and she knew that we had one. A person who had had previous issues with alcohol. So we went and saw that person that day. And she immediately also started to help me with that. And they got me into a support group with other people who had those issues. So almost within 48 hours, I was fully supported, surrounded by people who had had these issues before. And I started to feel, you know, oh, wow, I'm not the only one who gone through this. Here are all these people who had these issues 10, 20, 30 years ago. They're living the best life ever now. So I start to get this huge, you know, booster of hope, which is what we need as human beings. You know, a lot of uh, friends that I have who have entered recovery, um, and it, and usually it it doesn't work on the first try. Um, there's relapses, um, and again, I'm not speaking from my personal experiences, but what I've observed from from friends and family. But when they say once you are on the other side. You, you don't realize how good life can be. Um, 
you know, and it's um, it's it's definitely a message of hope that I hear, you know, from people who who are struggling is that, hey, look, you, you might be scared about what about what you're about to go through. Um, but the other side is is beautiful and um, and and worth working towards. Yes, absolutely, Mike. And uh, I'm now four and a half, almost five years into my recovery. I am one of the lucky people who, who from that moment managed to, to you know, get it. Uh, and that said, it could, a relapse could always happen. But I built something now and the support network I have around me and the, the honesty I believe I have with me and people close to me is there and I don't think and I don't hope that that would be broken. So if I would have a slip, I would be honest and own up to it and I would set things right. And uh, that is not the space I was in five years ago when it was all isolation and keeping secrets and so on. And that is the danger because if we're not honest with ourselves about things and the people close to us, then who can help us? Well, I mean, it it, you know, it sounds like two two keys here are your you know, your ability and your insight to say, Hey, there is something wrong here. Um, I'm, I'm doing something wrong. Um, voicing that to somebody else and not just yourself and then asking other people for help. Um, are though, did I, am I understanding that correctly? That's that's simple like that. It's not rocket science here, Mike, but it is (laughs) that we we're dealing with our egos and our emotions and, we don't want people to get into the details of our life. We don't want to expose ourselves. Like you said, also, we're embarrassed and we rather hide it. And that is the major issue here. Um, well, tell me about your motivation to write the book and why it was important for you to do so. And um, well, I start there. I mean, when when did you just start writing to, to write this book and, and what was your process for writing it? Yeah, so in 2018, then when I was in recovery, I I didn't speak openly about, you know, how great it was, how good I was feeling and so on. I kept it to my close circle um, and the anonymous support groups and so on. But every day, you know, you were around people and you were sharing your how you were feeling and so on. And I realized that for every time I shared something uh, how I was feeling, the better it went. And every time I repeated my story, sharing what I'd gone through, I felt better and hearing then others, getting that sympathy. And then at this stage also, you know, already after a few weeks in recovery, you're asked to start helping other newcomers. So suddenly you're not a newcomer anymore. You're giving back the gift. And they say in the recovery that you have to give back the gift to keep it. Um, so, so that is something I started to live and breathe. And um, about one year then into my recovery, sadly, a colleague and friend of mine died of suicide, completely unexpected. And that's when, again, my life completely changed on that day. And that's when I decided to speak up. I set up a charity fund uh, 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 immediately to raise awareness then for suicide prevention. And uh, with that, it went viral. I made a post on LinkedIn and it went completely viral. So, and then again, within 48 hours, I was on live radio, I was on TV, I had a four page feature in the biggest business newspaper in Singapore, which still to date is the biggest mental health piece that ever been written in this country. So with that, you know, uh, I had a few months where everyone wanted to interview me because I was talking about something that no one until that date in here in Singapore, at least was able to or dared to speak about. Uh, so that's when I thought, you know, I'm onto something here. If I can spread this message and even prevent one of these suicides uh, and make people speak up, then I will keep going. And that's when I took this idea to a publisher who was happy to go forward with the idea. Okay. And then um, how long uh, how long did it take you to write the book? Well, I think the, the lockdowns helped me. It speed uh, accelerated things up. It was my lockdown project to do all these interviews and, and so on then on, on, uh, on Zoom. Uh, so it, it took me about one and a half a year. Otherwise, I think it would have taken three, four years. Yeah. Um, so, you, you, I mean, the book is certainly focused on executives because, I mean, just looking at the title, Executive Loneliness, why was it important for you to focus um, or have that as sort of a, a focus point, executives? 
Well, I realized then when I was looking at my career myself as an executive that, you know, I'd kept all the secrets and that is, was the starting point of, you know, all the pains and the insecurities was that I kept it secret in the workplace. I didn't talk to my colleagues. I didn't talk to my boss. How I was feeling. I tried to deal with everything myself. I was worried what they would think of me. And I had to show that I'm, I'm worth my, my title. You know, it's the ego talking here. And I realized then at this stage, when I started to do interviews and serving other executives, that it was very common. And most senior executives were keeping it all to themselves. And I was not alone. Again, here, I realized I'm not alone. There's so many people who are suffering in the workplace. So that's why I decided to look into this. Plus, then my friend, Simon, who died of suicide, he was an executive himself. And no one of his colleagues or anyone around him had any idea that he had been suffering. Yeah. Um, so you, um, you're definitely focusing on it. It's really close in. I mean, this is, you're, you're speaking to yourself. You're speaking to the, the Simons of the world. Um, and I think it's important to, to kind of have that focus because, you know, you have a, you have a predefined target audience and I'm, I'm now I'm speaking with my marketing hat on, which is, um, you know, always, always important when it comes to, to, to publishing and promoting books, but um, you know, you mentioned there are five pathways to overcoming isolation, stress, anxiety, and depression. Um, can you can you share the, what those five pathways are? I mean, I know, I know we don't we don't want to give away the book, but um, can you talk to each of those pathways? Yeah, definitely happy to do that. So the the first one is taking stock. And with that, really, I mean that take a good look at ourselves, because that's where I realized that I didn't take an honest stock, stock take for many years. And, and I mean, if you're a shop owner, you would can take stock every month or quarter or you know, yearly at least to know where you are at. But as human beings, how often do we do that? Get the pen and paper out and with that, you know, write down everything that, you know, in this case, in my case, I had stopped exercising. I was drinking too much alcohol. I had gained, you know, 60, 70 pounds. I had all these things. I kept secrets. I had broken relationships. I had a lot of you know, resentments against a lot of people. Everything that had to go in a spreadsheet or on a piece of paper. Yeah. Yeah. And it's those secrets that get you. It's the secrets and the secret behaviors um, that, that kind of no one sees you doing. Um, and of course, there's so much embarrassment and shame there. But um, but they are, I mean, they are certainly a symptom of, of bigger problems. Um, so we've yeah. got, our, we've got our first one. What's number two. That was taking that list and looking line by line, who can I get help with here? You know, it's obviously the health was to go to a doctor. The alcohol problem was to get a support group for that. And in my case, and, and the, you know, the, the other things, there's always a coach for everything you can get help with. And I, I reached out to my network, you know, a nutritionist, I got a fitness coach uh, who helped me to sign up for the, some tracking device app and set me some goals here, what you follow this for the next three months, you know, so it was all about, you know, really uh, in the second step was asking for help, uh, Mike. So we're taking stop, we're asking for help. And uh, the next one on the list is, is, is what? Getting healthy. So it was really, that was the priority first, you know, really sorting myself out uh, both physically and mentally and get clarity, but especially when you're coming out of an addiction, it, it was really the priority to getting well. And uh, in this instance, I had to gotten quite a lot of medicine, medication then from the doctor. And it was about starting tapering off this. And I realized, and I call it in my book, the natural happy pill, which is exercise. So as I was able to increase the level of exercise, I could start to taper off the drugs. And it took me about three months to come clean from all of this. Yeah, I was wondering, how long did it take you to get back to your previous level of fitness? Uh, I actually, uh, after about six to seven months from my initial recovery, I ran a half marathon. After 13 months, I did a full Ironman event. A full Ironman. Yeah. And for those people who don't know what an Ironman is, just briefly describe what's involved in an Ironman. Well, I'm better at kilometers, so you might need to convert it, but it's a 3.8 kilometer swim. It's a 180 kilometer bike ride, and then you run a marathon at the end of that in one go. That's right. That's a, uh, so 13 months after 
Um, and just during recovery, you're, you're, you're one of the biggest endurance races in the world. Um, you are, uh, you are participating in it. That's, that's amazing. What, what did that do for your, um, I mean, I, I know your physical health, you know, has to be top shape to go through something like that, but what did it do for your mental health being able to complete an Ironman? Well, I was full of life at this stage. And also I did a race in the memory of Simon and I did it to raise awareness and money for the charity fund that I then had set up. And so it was the whole community was behind me and following it. And it, it, so it was a, a completely amazing experience to do that. And I had a lot of uh, talks the following months after the race. I was just uh, giving keynotes to all kinds of organizations about the transformation because it was so fast and so obvious that everyone wanted to know and understand how it was possible. Yeah. And I say there, there's no better feeling than the high you get from prolonged exercise to me. Um, there's, there's no drug you can take. There's no drink you can take that, that will replace how good you feel for hours after like a really good long endurance run. Yeah, completely agree. So we've taken stock. We've asked for help. We've gotten healthy. What's number four on our list? Uh, it's nurturing healthy relationships. And what I mean with that was that in my case, then when I took stock, it was some people I realized I had resentments against some of the old bosses who terminated me and so on. I was still carrying that pain with me. There was also people I had harmed. Uh, I had a broken relationship with my sister, uh, for example, and I, some of my past colleagues and so on, when I was thinking about them also, there, there was things I have said that, you know, was not nice. So basically here I had to really go back and clean up this. I had to go back to make amends. I had to apologize. And uh, I was then in a recovery program where I got a sponsor to help me through that, someone who'd done it before. But this is something that the, anyone can do with the help of a coach or someone also. And uh, I'm also listing the steps how to do this in my book. But what I realized here was that, you know, it was so much pain that was lifted from me because most of these pains were just sitting in my mind and I just had to clear this up. So there's there's that aspect of it is almost kind of going back and asking for forgiveness or making things right. Did you find that there were some people in your life that you had to put a boundary around that you, that you couldn't interact with the way you used to? Yeah, certainly. And there was also some people that you couldn't go back to to do this. Some people might not be around anymore. You don't know where they are. Or they could be remarried. So uh, even then you could write the letter and burn it or throw it in, 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 in the rubbish bin. But at least you put down an apology or maybe said a prayer about it or something. Uh, but it certainly was some things that you could just couldn't deal with. But then at least you've written it down. You've been thinking about it and ideally spoken to another person about this as well. You just mentioned saying a prayer, Nick. Did did um, did your personal spirituality change at all during this period of time? It did. It did certainly, and it is about uh, deflating the ego, and that is a very common uh, issue for senior executives or executives in the workplace. Uh, people tend to uh, find that you know it is quite a lonely career if you want to elbow your way to the top. Yeah. Um, all right. So we we've gotten through four. Um, what's number five? Yeah, it's pretty close to what the, uh, the question there on spirituality, because it's about finding a purpose and really looking at something, you know, a little bit deeper in yourself, uh, finding something that, you know, excites you or realizing that you are not the one, you know, running the universe, that you are not the center of the universe. And, uh, when we talk about, you know, finding a God for many senior executives or for many of us. Uh, that's something that perhaps we have uh, resentments around. Perhaps we feel that it was something that perhaps our parents or school pushed on us. So we pushed it away. And those are the feelings we have with us. And that is not perhaps doing us any good uh, as we're going through this stage. We need to try to, you know, come to terms with that and think, think about it from a perspective more or less. Uh, is it really me who's the center of the universe? Uh, could it be something bigger out there uh, or something else? Uh, then just accepting this for a start is the, is a good start uh, is what I found and then take it from there. But uh, in my case, then my purpose, my calling was to give back that I, I realized that I had found the key uh, to, you know, go through this 
um, and I wanted to help others. And that is now my my real purpose and driver. And what excites me is to constantly help other people who are into these challenges and sharing what I did, the simple steps I took and how I'm feeling much better today. And as you said before, you have to give back the gift to keep it. Yeah. And this book certainly sounds like a gift and probably a good gift idea. If you're, if you do anyone in your life who is uh, uh, in need of something like this, um, Nick, tell, tell the, uh, the listeners where they could pick up the five pathways. I'm sorry, where they could pick up executive loneliness, the five pathways to overcoming isolation, stress, and anxiety and depression in the modern business world. Yeah, they can find it on Amazon, Mike. It's a, it was a bestseller on men's health, mental health, and a few other categories. So it's certainly on Amazon. And also due to many executives saying I'm too busy to read, I don't have the time. So uh, it's also on Audible. I'm not the narrator, but it's a professional narrator as well. And it's, it's very popular as an audio book. Um, and then, uh, Nick, if people want to connect with you, do you have a website or social media that um, people can choose to, to follow you on? Yeah, certainly. I'm on LinkedIn and they can look up uh, Nick Johnson. That's uh, N-I-C-K-J-O-N-S-S-O-N at dot com. Uh, well, yeah, the website is nickjohnson.com also. Same spelling. All right, Nick, is there anything else you'd like to share with the listeners of Uncorking a Story? Well, I think just a, a final message, Mike, to thank you for here, uh, for, for inviting me here today. And also for the listeners, if you have something on your mind, something that's giving you pain, don't hold it to yourself. Think about who can I speak with? Uh, is it a wife, a husband, a colleague, a friend, or calling any of the uh, anonymous hotlines that are all there with volunteers like myself who are happy to help. And uh, we are all waiting for your call. If, if you have any pain, we can support you with. Well, I think that's a great point to end on. Nick, thank you for letting me uncork your story. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for listening to Uncorking a Story. If you'd like more information about today's guest or to find out more about Mike, go to uncorkingastory.com. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us at Apple Podcasts Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Tune in every week to hear Mike Carlin uncork a new story.